Hi everybody, yeah, happy to see you all here. So uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about Ira Caldera and some uh, interesting uh, implications it has for the magmatic time scales associated with caldera forming eruptions. So, ah, oh, there we go, neat. Um, so, okay, so uh, in the last decade, there's been this paradigm shift in the way that we think about magmatic time scales. Uh, diffusion studies have shown that eruptable magma um, is, is more of an ephemeral feature uh, and instead is, is generally uh, stored in, in cold storage. And that means that the time scales needed to amass, uh, you know, hundreds to thousands of cubic kilometer of magma can be hundreds of years to thousands of years, not tens of thousands of years or more. Um, however, then uh, in the last two years, uh, there have been uh, two brand new studies that um, have looked at titanium and quartz uh, diffusion, uh, diffusivity coefficient, and, and that would suggest uh, time scales that are 1,200 to 3,500 times longer uh, than previous authors have suggested, and that would require warm storage. Um, and so it turns out that Ira Caldera uh, provides a unique opportunity to assess these time scales, and we'll talk about that here in the future. Uh, but first, a little bit of uh, background for Ira Caldera. Uh, so it is located in southern Japan on the southern island of Kyushu and is located within the uh, Kagoshima Graben along with some other uh, calderas there. Uh, it's about 15 kilometers in diameter and now hosts, uh, hosts Sakurajima, which is one of the most active volcanoes on Earth. Um, and so uh, in terms of the actual caldera forming eruption, uh, it occurred about 30,000 years ago. Um, and uh, it erupted 400 cubic kilometers of magma dense rock equivalent. And uh, here we can see the, the caldera shown in red there. Uh, the Osumi pumice fall deposit uh, was 40 cubic, cubic kilometers, and then followed by the Ito ignimbrite shown in the pink in that figure, uh, which can be quite thick. There's short me down there for scale. And, um, but what's really interesting about the Ira caldera system is there were these three pre-caldera eruptions that preceded the, uh, the Osumi and Ito ignimbrite, and those were, uh, does this thing have a... Ooh, there we go. All right, so we have these uh, pre-caldera eruptions here, uh, three of them that occurred in the three and a half thousand years before the caldera forming eruption. And so this provides a unique opportunity to not only study how long does it take to amass that magma for the caldera forming eruption, but also why um, in a single caldera setting would there be some smaller eruptions, you know, 0.17 to two cubic kilometers. Um, and then um, in a completely different case, you have a much larger eruption. So what leads to one of these smaller precursory versus the caldera forming eruption? All right, let's get into it. So uh, I'm gonna present a couple of things that I've, that I've shown before, and then we'll get into the, the meat of the new stuff. So. Um, the Ira Caldera uh, are all high silica rhyolites, um, and so uh, and I'm going to use these uh, these colors here uh, for the rest of the talk here, where we've got whoop, there we go. So uh, they're all high silica rhyolites. So both the pre-caldera shown in colors and the caldera forming eruption are all between 77 and a half and 78 weight percent silica, except for this one gray pumice that erupted in the Osumi pumice fall. Um, major elements, they're pretty similar. Trace elements, there's some slight differences uh, between the pre-caldera and the caldera forming eruption, okay? So then, um, let's see. So then using the, uh, the rhyolite melts geobarometer, uh, we've got this figure here showing uh, pressure and then showing uh, these different eruptions in order of stratigraphic um, height going from older to younger here. And you can see that the uh, pre-caldera eruptions are remarkably similar between 75 and 125 megapascals, uh, and that the caldera forming eruption uh, pressures overlap uh, with those significantly, but range to a slightly deeper level. And then the, the gray pumice, uh, the little more mafic, um, are, are deeper. But you can see that there's definitely a lot of overlap between the pre-caldera and the caldera forming eruption in terms of the depth in the crust. So if all of these magmas were stored in the same spot inside of the crust, then the, the big million dollar question then is, uh, did the pre-caldera eruptions tap only a portion of the eruptible magma that was sitting there? Or was 400 cubic kilometers of, mag of eruptable magma amassed in only a thousand years? It's got to be one of those two. So, all right. So in order to, uh, to address that, we looked at uh, quartz diffusion um, using the cathode luminescence imaging of, of quartz here. Um, and so whoop, that's the wrong one. There we go. So then, uh, and then we fit a complementary air function to those profiles um, for cores and for rims. So I'm going to be focusing on the cores for this talk. Um, and, we can, and it turns out that the maximum time scales, uh, they consistently decrease from the, uh, from the core to the rim, indicating that diffusion is in, in fact occurring. 
Um, and so then when we plot up these, uh, these results here, we can see that there's no uh, upsection increase in the quartz residence time. So um, the caldera forming eruptions shown in the black and gray have similar time scales to the pre-caldera eruptions. And if the Cherniak uh, diffusivity is correct, then at 750 degrees Celsius, which according to Rhyolite melts, is about the rheological lockup temperature of these, uh, then we're looking at um, all quartzes from all eruptions um, would have only been diffusing for about 800 years, okay? But if we use the new Jollens at all uh, diffusivity, we're looking at quartzes that have been sitting around diffusing at 750 degrees Celsius for a million years. And if Autotot's uh, diffusivity is correct, then these quartzes are sitting at 750 degrees Celsius for 3.3 million years. All right, let's continue. Uh, so then, uh, if we then put this up here on this, uh, on this timeline, these are the eruption ages uh, with the uh, caldera forming eruption here. Then if we plot up the three oldest quartz crystals from each one of these eruptions, that's shown here. And then if we account for the amount of time that uh, quartz had not uh, saturated, and we use that uh, using a methodology with rhyolite melts, happy to tell you about that after the talk. Um, then this shows the total amount of time, uh, total estimated amount of time that the rhyolite magma was crystallizing, okay? And so you can see that, oh, not yet, here we go. So you can see that the quartz crystals uh, found in the caldera forming eruptions were not crystallizing when any of these pre-caldera eruptions happened. And even if we account for the time that was not recorded by quartz, um, it seems there's very little uh, overlap indicating that each batch of magma started uh, forming and crystallizing after the previous eruption, all right? Uh, but if, if in fact, uh, Auditat and Jolin's uh, uh, diffusivity is correct, this would be a totally different uh, picture. So therefore, we decided to start looking at plagioclase. All right, so very briefly, uh, plage tends to have this, uh, tends to have a low anorthite patchy core surrounded by a high anorthite zone, and then a euhedral very sharp decrease in anorthite towards the rim. And it seems that this, uh, this was the, the bulk of the action that happened to plagioclase in that uh, the rim tends to be uh, pretty monotonous with uh, some oscillations of, of about five anorthite, and, uh, and some of them have a resorption event, but only an increase in anorthite of 10. So the big uh, you know, resorption event was just this one here. So um, this is an example here where we go from core to rim, and you can see that we go from having a uh, low anorthite to a sharp increase in anorthite, going from that patchy uh, zone to, the, uh, to that mantle. And associated with that increase in anorthite, there's a slight increase in strontium. Then further down, we have a decrease in anorthite and again, a increase in strontium. And so if we overlay then the equilibrium uh, that we would expect either from partitioning or from de uh, full diffusive re-equilibration, um, then we should expect a, a negative correlation here between anorthite and strontium. Uh, if we do that's for, a, for the glass, which has 80 parts per million strontium. And then if it was in equilibrium with the whole rock at 180 parts per million strontium, that's what it would look like. But either way, we should be expecting, after full diffusive re-equilibration, we should expect a strong negative correlation, which of course we don't see here. And so it turns out that if we use uh, the more simplified uh, diffusion equations um, and Python scripts from Schleter et al. and Lubbers et al. 2022, uh, it's much easier to, uh, to model this situation uh, where we have uh, this uh, positive uh, correlation between strontium and anorthite um, than it is the more common situation where we have this negative correlation as we're going from that high anorthite to that low anorthite rim, okay? Um, and so to explain that a little bit further, uh, here we have this same example of the plage here. Uh, the dots indicate the observed uh, strontium content versus distance uh, from core. And this uh, dotted line here is the, uh, the expected strontium equilibrium. And then over time, uh, this, is, this is it diffusing. If we use this simple model where we have a, a step function um, here, then a diffusion causes uh, us to progress towards that equilibrium, right? So that's, that's easier to do using the simplified case. And then we, um, we fit it and do a Monte Carlo simulation. But unfortunately, um, there are, we only, took transects of three of these cores because a lot of them have tiny little patches and we can't be sure the uh, three-dimensional geometry, although that will be future work. So if we did this for a range of initial conditions, then for those three cores, we get a range of 620 to uh, 2400 years of diffusion time. Unfortunately, we, uh, we measured 
Oh, there we go. So 25 of these boundaries here where we go from high anorthite to low anorthite. But this becomes difficult because uh, using this methodology, it's difficult to know uh, how to assign the initial conditions. Do we have it like this, where then diffusion would cause, um, would cause the profile to go away from the observed? Or should we start it out this way, where it, uh, the diffusion would cause it uh, to go towards the observed profile? So um, that, that kind of made it a little bit more difficult. But uh, as you can see, what's very important is that these observed uh, values are nowhere near what would be expected um, if we had let it diffuse until it got uh, to diffusive re-equilibration. All right? So um, then if we plot here, we have strontium versus anorthite content and color-coded from distance uh, from the core. And you can see that there's a slight negative correlation, but it's not nearly steep enough to be um, at the equilibrium predicted by the 80 parts per million content in the glass or the 180 parts per million expected by the whole rock. And here's an interesting case where going from the core, we have this, we have this negative correlation here, but again, not in equilibrium for the, for the core. And then for the rim, we have this positive correlation indicating uh, significant differences in the amount of time uh, for diffusion. And for all of the plagioclase rims, we kind of see this, uh, this positive correlation. All right, so it turns out that, uh, so then here's, uh, here are all of the observed, value, um, observed uh, values for the slope of, um, you know, the, these slopes of these lines here. Um, and you can see the cores have a range from slight positive to no uh, trend to slight negative trend, but none of them have a negative enough trend to be in equilibrium here. Um, and you can see that whereas the rims tend to always have this slight positive trend. Okay, so turns out that Cooper and Kent in uh, 2014, we've all read the paper, but um, many of us maybe have not looked at the supplementary figures. So this is a pretty critical one here um, where um, they modeled that uh, these profiles should go from a slight positive correlation to no correlation to a slight negative to a very strong negative correlation uh, with time. So we went ahead and we modeled that. Uh, with a bunch of different uh, rim values here. So then we start out with uh, the, uh, we, our initial condition shown by black and the equilibrium profile here. And if we let it diffuse for one year, this is what the strontium versus anorthite content will look like. If we let it diffuse for 10 years, it looks like this. We get to 50 and then 100, we're starting to get a little bit less of a positive correlation. It's becoming a lot less, uh, a lot smaller of a um, correlation coefficient. 250, 500 years, we've got no uh, correlation here. It's pretty flat. And then as we continue to diffuse, we're at 1,000 years, 1,500, 2,000 years. Now we have a really nice uh, negative correlation here, okay? Going into 25 and then 5,000 years, all right? And then 10,000 years. So come back to the observed values for the cores here. Uh, I want to point out that there's no difference between the um, slopes of the uh, caldera forming versus pre-caldera. And now, um, and the slopes tend to be less than negative 500 and nowhere near what we'd expect from um, equilibrium. If we overlay those, uh, those models that I just showed you that animation of, color-coded by diffusion, diffusion time going from blue to yellow, you can see that the observed value, the observed slope of about negative 500 is less than 2,500 years according to this uh, modeling. Um, and then if we were to look at it at 800 degrees Celsius, um, then we're looking at time scales of only 300 to, eight, uh, to 800 years, okay? So, um, so then finally, uh, that, bring, that brings us to two possible scenarios here. So one is that the, uh, the max uh, quartz residence time at 750 degrees Celsius is 800 years as predicted by Cherniak's diffusivity. Um, and then plagioclase, as I just showed you, must have only been diffusing for between, uh, you know, up to about two and a half thousand years, which would mean, and so then that's, uh, here's, here's that timeline diagram again, here's plagioclase diffusion of one to 2,500 2, years. That would mean that quartz records 16 to 32% of the total crystallization time. Well, that's consistent with what rhyolite melts predicts, about 16 to 55% of the total time. And if this is the case, that means there's little to no overlap in those eruptible magmas. And therefore, the caldera forming eruption, uh, the 400 cubic kilometers were amassed in less than 1,000 years. Now, the alternative scenario looks like this. So now, notice the change in the axes here. We're going up to nearly a million years. Um, and in this case, uh, the quartz would be sitting there at 750 degrees Celsius for about 3.3 million years. Um, and then 
Uh, whereas plagioclase, we've shown, could have only been sitting there for two and a half uh, thousand years. So this is what quartz, uh, this is what plagioclase looked like. You can't even see it compared to how long quartz has been crystallizing. Uh, and I'd like to point out these are the ages of the global compilation of uh, uranium lead and uh, thorium radium ages. Um, and so then this would indicate then that quartz, no plagioclase, there must have been a magma sitting here with no plagioclase and only quartz for over 97% of the time, which, uh, as we all know, is never predicted by rhyolite melts, particularly in this case. That would also mean that we would have had five batches of eruptible magma at the same location and the same depth, and they, they weren't uh, tapped, and therefore that 400 kilometers, cubic kilometers of magma is selectively untapped during these four previous eruptions. I'm being told I'm out of time, but I have a really cool lithium story if you want to talk to me later. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even see you. Yeah. No, it's okay. I see you. It's like some bad angling. Yeah. I would probably have time for one quick question because we are going to attempt to zoom in Casey, and that might take us a second. Yeah, and you can. Thanks, for, uh, that was a good talk that I'm here. Yeah, hey, all right. <laughs> um, is it possible that your, uh, the differences in timescales between your quartz and, and plagioclase really uh, reflects um, the, f the fact that your quartz zoning is not actually produced by diffusion but by growth? Yeah, so I think that um, the, way that I can, the way that I can tell that that's probably not the case is the fact that the cores of the, um, of the quartzes always show more diffusion. I don't care what um, diffusivity you use, the, uh, the diffusive length scale within the core is much longer than the intermediate, is much longer than the rim. So that indicates to me that there must be diffusion occurring. Yeah. Yeah, do we have time? Are you working on it? Well, while they're working on it, why not? Let's do it. Is it possible that the um, unrealistic, the long time scales, is it possible that they could have been very long time scale, but that there were times where it wasn't nearly as hot as you were guessing? Yeah, so if, if it turns out that those time scales were times when it wasn't nearly that hot, then we'd require even longer time scales, right? So then that, those time scales that I showed, that 3.3 million years, that means it would have had to be at least 750 degrees Celsius for up to 3.3 million years. If it was cooler, we would require even more time, right? So, um, you know, there, there could have been times when it was really, really, really hot, but then why don't we get rid of the quartz? Gotta figure it out. Casey, if you can hear us.